Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining the session. And one of our participants was asking me, do you think the people felt the energy at the end of uh, such a long conference? So do you have the energy? If you do, raise your hand. Thank you. OK, we will talk about disinformation and disruption. And I would like to welcome a group of the very distinguished guests to go more into depth. She is one of the strongest advocates for media development and media freedom from Africa. She's a senior media professional, director of the Namibian Media Trust, and the chairperson of the Global Forum for Media Development. Please welcome Zoe Titus. Our second guest is from Sri Lanka originally. She's a true expert on the intersection between technology, policy, and human rights. She takes responsibility for high level posi positions in a list, a long list of distinguished civil society organizations, and is currently CEO of the think tank Learn Asia, Heleni Galpaya. My next guest is from Ethiopia, living in Germany currently, and he's been going through all the ups and downs of being a tech entrepreneur. He's been building his own language model and a startup called Lesan around it. Asmelash Teka Hagtgu. And last but not least, please welcome the representative from the political sphere of media development. He's the head of the unit for human rights, inclusion, and media, and responsible for the media development program, which also finances many of the programs of Deutsche Welle Academy at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Please welcome Dr. Michael Schlomps. So, all of you are stakeholders or representatives from, uh, of stakeholders from the media sector, which is very diverse. And we know that we have this call to action that we should not only talk, but do something to ensure the safety and the freedom of this very much changing media space. Zoe, you're sitting at the table uh, on the side of the GFND, representing the media, um, the media society, especially from, from Africa. What are you actually doing? Um, Um, my particular interest would probably be around the ethical use of AI, um, most definitely on the policy um, and regulatory side. Um, but most importantly, I think uh, my interest and the general development community or media support community from which I come is particularly um, focused on ensuring that journalism survives AI and public interest journalism specifically. Okay, Helani, same question to you. What are you really shaping in this important process? We are policy researchers and we do applied research. And I think our role is in part to understand this wicked social, economic, political problem of misinformation and AI. So to understand the interdependencies between the human systems, the technical systems, the political and economic, but also to understand the effectiveness of some of these so-called countermeasures. We hear about fact-checking. We talk to, in 26 countries, 89 people involved in this. Very few know the impact of their fact-checks. Does it even reach the audience? Lots of digital media training they don't know what the effect of those things are, and so on. So we use scientific approaches 
to, let's say, almost like quasi-experimental studies to understand five different interventions right now in the field and trying to measure and how we scale them up. That's another one. The third part, I think, is the really hands-on techie work that we and other research communities do. One of the reasons we in the majority world are at a disadvantage is we don't have the huge baggage of data and the natural language processing tools. The basic work hasn't been done for the languages outside of the top 12 languages. So if you want to do this in Bengali and Sinhalese, you don't have the language corpus, you don't have sentiment analysis engines, you don't have the basic language, these are resource poor. So researchers need to sit and actually build these tools so other people can then use it, like journalists. So that's our role. And that's a perfect cue for Asma, actually, who is doing exactly that. You have built a language model for um, Amharic and uh, Tig Tigrinya. Uh, and then what happened? What, how can you feed this into this big global process? Where is your place? Where are you bringing in change? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're building, we've already built a, the most advanced machine translation system. Um, for Amharic and Tigringa and English. Um, and as I said, I'm originally from Tigray, Ethiopia. You might have heard about Tigray in relation to the conflict that has been happening. Um, in the overall space, uh, I would say we're in AI, this exciting future in a way. Um, but like I belong to this community of creators, uh, especially in the African continent. There's a movement of grassroots organizations. You might have heard of Masakane and other startups such as Lesan, Ghana, NLP, Lelapa. So it's a sort of like smaller organizations and um, community rooted organizations that are trying to carve a different future than what exists today. If you look at um, AI, today it's being done by a handful of multinational corporations or big tech companies. We believe we have an alternative, a more compelling future, one that's owned and created by um, people that belong to their communities. Mr. Schlumpf, how are you shaping the process? How is the German development po policy shaping it? We try to shape something. Um, I would say we are in a constant struggle in a constant state of competition, competition for attention, uh, resources, and we are in these times of multiple crises um, competing with issues, very broadly speaking, migration, climate change, education, and then we always raise our finger and say, well, media development is important too, disinformation um, is a completely underestimated risk to mankind. Um, and we try everything we can in every channel um, in every way to, to get the message heard. Good to know. Um, I was looking back at yesterday also, I, there were a few quotes of people saying, let's not make the same mistakes we made uh, with the introduction of social media. So, um, do you think that we are really in a, at a different moment in time? I'm not so sure because I was talking to a lot of people um, here and I had the impression everybody knows there's something big and bad coming, but do we really have a coordinated approach? Are we really in action? Um, and do we even know what the issues are? So when preparing for this panel, I just typed it into ChatGPT. The question was, uh, what are the biggest challenges for media systems in the global south in the context of disinfo and AI? And to be honest, um, it took less than two seconds. Uh, in the English version, I had a pretty good briefing of the problems, the reasons, also ideas for solutions, well-structured, nice to read. I did the same in German. And it was a lot less um, concise and, and, and had a lot less depth. What we did then, we tried uh, to ask the Amharic model to give us an answer. And we have a slide showing the result. 
Asma, could you explain what we see here? I'm sure that um, we won't be able to actually read it, most of us, but yeah. why do you have all these, um, these circles and the different colors in the answer? Yeah, so the prompt uh, was the same uh, question that uh, is translated into Amharic here, um, and we used human translators to make sure you know we have multiple versions. And what you see here is like the best question uh, that all the translators kind of voted. The output, um, if you can see the boxes, words that make sense, words that were just copies from the prompt or out of context words and made up words. So the result overall, we're not talking about answering the question. This is gibberish at best. And this is the current state of um, ChatGPT, the most advanced kind of like generative AI for Amharic. Um, we had another slide, which is even worse, for Tigringa, which is my mother tongue, spoken by 10 million people around the world. So one would assume that ChatGPT, uh, that OpenAI would be really happy to cooperate with you and um, to include the knowledge you have into their systems. And that's what you also thought, and then what happened? That would be a wonderful opportunity to collaborate and fill that gap. What happens is big players, big tech companies, um, if you are a startup founder, an organization from areas that, you know, say from Africa, to begin with, you're not even treated as like a business partner. You're just more like, oh, we heard you have like a lot of data for this language. Do you want it to be included? Uh, in our system, so give us all the data you have. That's the kind of discussion. It's not like you know, a small startup in Germany is talking to Meta or the other, the other companies. So the discussion is more like, give us everything you have, and then what? We'll just make it part of um, you know, their solution. My answer to that and my wish, and we're not just wishing, we're actually executing, is for an ecosystem of, let's say, AI companies that are interoperable. So if somebody in West Africa creates a language technology that does the translation, but I have a chatbot that answers questions, they can in interact with each other to give a seamless interaction for the user. That's the, you know, the future we want to create, and we're actively seeking that. And who are you addressing? Are you addressing the tech companies? Helani, whom do we, if we want to create this inclusive environment, who can, who's responsible for, the, responsible for the framework? You were also looking at the business case. I think the tech companies have a huge responsibility, but it's not only the tech company. Part of the problem is that we've all looked at the tech companies to solve these problems, and there's a clear business interest. There's and tech companies are not uniform. He's running a tech company, but he, he needs to still get into the game. So all kinds of tech companies, absolutely. And I think they just need to come to the point, the big guys, that you can't solve this problem. You're part of the disinformation machine and you're not solving it. And you can't solve it without the cooperation of a lot of others. The problem they're solving now is helping our governments take down content that the government doesn't like. That's not the solution for misinformation. So that's part of the problem, right? But I think it does need... So you're saying content moderation doesn't work? Content moderation works in some situations. And we need to understand what does content moderation mean? We think about takedowns as content moderation, right? Maybe in the best case, notice and takedown. You tell the producer and you take it down. But there's a whole lot of things that you should be exploring. Simple things like labeling, getting the producer of the content to carry a label. So if you look at Singapore's model, the POFMA, which I think is a bad law where the minister gets to decide on content, the one good thing there is that it has a graded list of offenses and actions. Only the really extreme case is taking down the content and deplatforming that user majority of the decisions given by the government are about the creator of the content posting a note that this has been disputed. See, I mean, and there's a whole lot of steps in between, right? So I think we just need to add nuance to what content moderation means as well. And but don't we assume that AI will be a very good use in exactly that? I think AI can do some things, so at the point of posting the idea of detecting the fakeness or the truthfulness, right? So we 
try to train NLP, natural language processing models. Uh, and we hit about 93% accuracy compared to human moderators on whether information is truthful, less truthful, mostly truthful, etc. right? Then you run into the problem of to understand at scale truthfulness, you also need at scale data of truth and untruths. You also have these language uh, challenges. That doesn't exist. So then you need a set of uh, programmers who instead of a large language model that trains on 350 million data points, we have to train our models on 1,100 data points in Singhala, for example, right? So the kind of optimization is huge. Uh, there's that at the point of creation. But then at the point of once it's on the platform, so can the platforms do something about it that clearly fake news is either taken off or labeled? Yes, and they need to do a better job. Then the key part is dissemination and virality, right? Which I think only the platforms understand early virality because the point is not the fake post. The fake post going viral and causing danger is the real problem. And virality is early understood by the platform, right? On their platform. They don't understand it once it so crosses the platform. So they should platforms. be involved in a kind of an early warning system and disclose that data of... Um, malinformation or misinformation. Well, at least viral. disclose it to their fact checkers who are now in major some of our countries, because what's happening with the trusted flaggers of the various platforms is they don't understand virality. They're checking posts based on their funding models. Some are looking at medical information, some are looking at democracy and race. It depends on the NGO, the organization, right? I mean, uh, False information that's not viral, in fact, can be ignored by fact checkers. What you need to worry about, the false information that's viral. So virality and fakeness meeting is a matter for the fact checker, the model that is run, and civil society, and that process that has to decide, right? It has to be fast, it has to be multi-stakeholder. So you're not, not saying that we shouldn't have any more fact checking, but it should have a... Oh no, we need okay. fact checking, absolutely, right? But I think the real danger is not understanding the viral pieces of information and not being able to pre-bunk, right? Once the fact checker notices it, it's already pretty large and out there. Zoe, looking at the African context, um, if you hear this, um, obviously there's a, a huge demand for resources, for capacity that isn't as available as in the so-called global north. Do you see that there's enough expertise, in ex enough energy in the sector to even deliver all of this? I think we need to acknowledge one thing, that the knowledge gap between the global north and the global south is diminishing. So I do believe that the capacity is there. Um, if the capacity is resourced um, and most importantly has access to data because fundamentally that is the issue at hand. Um, I'm involved in a growing movement um, around civil society and researchers demanding that we have access to platform data, to big tech data. And it's how successful data. are you with this? Well, we'll keep trying. <laughs> um, it's our data. Um, and they should, and we should have access because that is the data that we need to train um, the interfaces and the models for good, for AI for good. So your asks are clear. You're addressing the tech sector um, who gets, I think, a lot of questions every day. Where does development policy come in here? How can you assist with this to bring it to a, another level of political discussion and also put up the pressure a little bit? Difficult question. I would say um, we shouldn't overestimate the influence of development policy. Um, we are not omnipotent. Um, but if there is a demand from the Global South, and that's the key, the ownership of countries of the Global South, then the development machinery keeps going. Um, but in general, I think it's more than development policy sphere, it's global politics in general. And in, in a way, well, I would have never imagined me sitting on a panel and quoting the Pope, but I, I think this is exactly what I'm going to do. Um, political action is urgently needed, this is what he said. Um, 
And I think there are some technical solutions to some technical challenges, but the main answer has to be political. And if we take a look at, for instance, the, the Global Risk Report this year, um, putting disinformation on risk number one, um, and others, migration, pollution, climate change, follow. Just imagine how much resources international politics is investing, not only, not only financial, um, in terms of political will, in terms of expertise, human resources, and then financial resources. On all these issues, migration, climate change. I don't say it's, it's enough, but just compare that to what international politics is investing to fight disinformation. It's ridiculous, and that has to change. Yeah, that's what we keep saying. <laughs> but international politics is not only the global north, but mainly the politics, the political systems in your countries. And Zoe, do you think that there's enough awareness about you know, the magnitude of these challenges, about there's enough readiness to actually say, let's engage here. Are the responsible politicians in, let's say, Southern Africa, do you know they're aware? Do you think they're aware? I think that there's a strong level of awareness, but um, let's consider two issues. Um, what big tech is doing to media, and I'm speaking always in the context of media, what big tech is doing to media is what many of our governments want. They're decimating the media. So leave it to big tech to kill off the media, and then we can go ahead and do as we plan. Second thing is, um, it's always a catch-up game. Um, at a policy development level, which we expect our policy makers um, to uh, do proactively, it's just not at that level. Um, we, in most instances in Southern Africa, um, for the largest part of the continent, there are no data protection laws in place. We're not speak, even speaking of AI policy. So we're lagging far behind in terms of the policy um, and legal frameworks that are required. And then, a third issue to consider. Um, I'm from Namibia, small country, um, well, big country, very small population. So our GDP is probably um, the monthly budget of Facebook. Um, so there are power dynamics. So throw into this whole discussion um, issues like the digital divide, and then we have to in this context. Yeah, we have to. Digital but who colonialism. Has to do exactly what? I think that's the the challenge we have. We all know that we have to do something, mm. but do we really know whom we are addressing for what kind of solutions? So if it's on the governmental level, yesterday uh, we, we looked at the, um, the regulation in the EU, which could be a blueprint, some mm. say, and a lot, of, a lot of others say there isn't, it's not the way to go. Helani, what, what's your take on that? Um, I think the EU is driving the regulation of this. A lot of it is amazing and aspirational. The kind of budgets and capacities in policy making and consistent fine-tuned policy making we have in many of the countries certainly I work in, a lot of it is not implementable. So to run a meaningful data commissioner's office, you know, I've heard Italy complaining about their budget. What are we talking about? How many lawyers do we have in Sri Lanka who can be employed, will give up their private sector employment? So we don't have fine-tuned models that we can implement that can have the same impact. That's part of the problem. Second, I think the global south, the majority world, is very, very interested in harnessing AI for employment innovation, right? And hasn't found that balance of the responsible approach to AI, which also enables all the positives that are there. So what you have instead, the policy response, is fake news laws. That's one of the first things that come before data protection laws in many countries, right? Mine is the first one in Asia to have a data protection law. But everyone is, is working on fake news laws, and that is about government decisions. So I think there's a problem. 
we're talking about solutions. Um, Asma, if, if you look at what you've created um, and you can see the impact this can, you can connect 80 million people, I think, uh, via um, translation. Is, do you see this, this is, I'm looking at the, the societies and the knowledge of people, do you think that simply by translating the knowledge of the world that is available there, the, 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 maybe the wisdom of the world, uh, you can really create change and um, a different kind of attention to the actual issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I get up every, every morning to create a piece of technology because I absolutely believe it has a positive, uh, it, can, it can bring a positive change. Uh, but before talking about that, let me press a bit on the awareness side. I'm not sure, for example, I come from Ethiopia, I told you, and over the past three, four years, um, social media platforms such as Meta and, and Twitter and others have been, you know, fueling basically the crisis, the genocidal war. I don't think people are aware the kind of like um, power these, these uh, com companies have and like tangible harmful effects they have. And I think we should start there. My experience of using these social media platforms in English is completely different when I use it in my language. And you know, the researchers and the people building these uh, technologies at big tech companies will tell you, we're using AI, we're taking down 95% of harmful content. But what that statistics doesn't tell you is how much of that is in a given language, how much of that is really harmful content that's really causing death on the ground. And, you know, for many of the geographies that I speak for in, in Africa, it's not like 95% of harmful content is being taken down. Um, the majority stays there. So as what needs to be done? What needs to be done is a great question. And this is the alternative future that um, we are providing with like-minded people is we can create, this is not inevitable. It's not that the next generation of tools, whether it's AI or other technologies, should be built by these big, big tech companies. Um, it could be on our own hands. And I'm representing those you know, small organizations, startups that are representing their communities, community-rooted startups. And if we can support them, like you know, governments or other um, funding agencies, um, you know, they usually come with come, uh, strings attached you know, when, when they want to support you know, these kind of initiatives. So you're saying that um, locally created models could create by itself a different kind of dialogue, one that is more peaceful, more less aggressive. Um, if, if that is the vision, and you look at Mr. Schlomps, what is your ask? What does the German development um, uh, cooperation, how can they help you? Yeah, absolutely. I wish... Um, they approach these organizations and learn from them because they have a thing or two they know about the context where they are operating. So if you look, I, I'm not sure about that specific, but I'm aware of like a German initiative that's you know helping to democratize AI in Africa. And they have two requirements if they want to support you, if you're a small organization. They say you have to open source your data, you have to open source your models. The thing is, what is AI? It's basically two things. You have a lot of good quality data, you have a lot of compute, and then out comes a good model. Now, if you ask all these small startups, small organizations, give up all the data, all the compute for the peanut, you know, that's, that we're gonna help you, you're enabling, in fact, the inequality because these big tech companies will come, scrape the web, put every data they could find and you're out of business, you're out of the picture. So my ask is, before even asking for funding or anything, listen to our needs, because we know our space, we know where we are operating, and we can start from there. I'm supposed to react. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I, I do not know the, the details of this project, of this initiative, uh, nor the, the strings attached. Uh, I find it very plausible what, what you say. I only know that this initiative, which is called Fair Forward, is, um, 
has quite a substantial funds and it's um, one of the very few initiatives in the area of AI or democratization of AI, which in itself is a good objective. Um, but it's telling to note that um, it's one of very, very few um, initiatives. So as far as I, I know, this, this, this language model yep, that uh, this project tried to, to set up, the databases um, helped to, to, to create a database in Swahili for roughly 150 million um, people. Um, and I think the, the objective of these kinds of initiatives can only be to, to showcase some best practices and to, to learn some lessons, maybe also in the sense that you have just outlined. Um, it cannot solve the, it cannot be one of the solutions. Um, it can only help Part. foster some change. So we wanted to respond to this. Yes. Um, I, I know that time is running out, but I had to uh, broadcast my call to action. Um, just recently, um, the OECD DAC uh, adopted uh, effective principles, um, principles for effective support um, to media. Um, well, it's uh, a long uh, line, but effectively it is asking, um, the ask is that more funding be made available to journalism and public interest journalism, and also understanding that journalists, journalism or the media is a sector in its own right that requires support. Um, and doing that, um, looking at the media as a sector and a development sector, as opposed to um, the funds that are, in most instances, larger budgets made available for media for development. Um, the journalism sector is in distress and it needs our support. So more resources, you both yeah. agree on that. I think probably all of you do. Helani. I want to come back to data and um, money. Um, I think the incentive for one company to say no when big tech comes and asks for the data set, it's very difficult because it's, you know, you're saying no to a pot of money, right? So this is a global issue. It's just like I have very little incentive to click the right buttons in the user agreement and say don't share. But collectively, there's a huge interest. So it's that collective interest we need to harness across the majority world. And funding is a big part of it. I think funders have a responsibility, but taxation is a big part of it, right? We are talking about the good and the evil. Taxation was created to subsidize good behavior and to punish, you know, and to tax and punish bad behavior. We are not using this as a tool that big tech companies are not even agreeing on the OECD or the various UN mandates. We need a global discussion with the funders, with the governments on how they will be taxed. We need to then hold our governments to account that they will spend that tax money that comes to the majority world individual governments on the right thing, that it doesn't just go into the consolidated budget and you know, gets used for political campaigns. So there's a long conversation, I think, on funding and taxation that's very relevant to this. And that's an interesting angle. Awesome. So it's not asking for regulation, but for a proper financing model that will be viable. May I add just a short Last point answer. there? Yeah. Um, so it's not only funding. I think uh, for the organizations I, I speak for, it's also business partnership. I think we are creating compelling technologies. If these were like covering European languages and you know other Spanish, um, <laughs> Spanish is a European language, you would be treated differently. You're a business partner. You're called a business partner. You create a compelling technology for, you know, African languages and so on. All of a sudden, it's more like charity, you know, relationship. I don't want that. We want business partnership so we can both thrive. Yeah. <laughs> Message well taken. So um, a, few, a few of the comments were we need a lot more long conversations. And yes, certainly we do. But uh, let's have them soon. And a lot of them because uh, time is running out, not only on this panel, but for the issue as such. Thank you very, very much for sharing this. Thank you. Thank you.